anime, everything and nothing changes. You are the shimmering young woman who found her voice when you were warned to be silent or have your body, body cut away from you like an elegant weed. You are the one whose spirit is present in the dappled stars. Joy Harjo, former United States Poet Laureate and member of the Muscogee Nation, wrote those words about anime picto aquash. Anime was a Mi'kmaq from Nova Scotia. A member of the American Indian Movement, she was involved in the 1973 Wounded Knee Incident at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. She was murdered on December, in December 1975. Anna Mae was Mary Bravebird's friend. Mary Bravebird, also known as Mary Crow Dog, is the focus of this month's Lives of the Spirit programming. She was a Lakota writer and community leader. Like her friend, she grew up in grinding poverty in an indigenous community far from urban centers. Like her friend, she was part of the American Indian movement. Like her friend, she was at Wounded Knee. Unlike her friend, she survived the violence of the 1970s and died of natural causes. So this morning we lift up Mary Brave Bird as a spiritual activist and not her friend Anna May because she was someone who survived. She was someone who survived. You are the one whose spirit is present in the dappled stars. It seems right to begin a sermon on Brave Bird with an invocation of her friend. Brave Bird's perspective on spirituality is that it was fundamentally a communal affair. We exist, she understood, first as members of a community and only secondarily as individuals. We exist, she saw, first as part of all being, and then second as ourselves. We are shaped by the history, the story of our peoples, and only secondarily our own biographies and experiences. Whiteness European culture, she knew, was built upon inverting these truths. This old way, which was built on the close-knit clan, she wrote, was what the missionary and government agent set out to destroy so that the government could turn indigenous peoples into white people. The objective, as one secretary of interior claimed, was to teach anime aquash Mary Brave Bird, and others native to this continent to learn, and this is a quote, the benefits of wholesome selfishness without which high civilization is impossible. The benefits of wholesome selfishness. The philosopher William James famously defined religion as the feelings, acts, and experiences of individuals in their solitude in relation to the divine. But Mary Brave Bird took exactly the opposite view. Religion and spirituality, as she understood them, were things that could only be engaged in collectively. They are found in shared ritual. They are experienced in the long dead voices, uh, or the voices of long dead relatives talking to me, she wrote. It is when the voice of the drum is the drumbeat in my heart, she observed. It is what affirms and reaffirms and reaffirms that we are part of the earth and that the earth is in me and I in it. The earth is in me and I in it. The benefits of wholesome selfishness, the dominant strains of European culture and European religion, 
or at least the various forms of Trinitarian Christianity, which make up the majority of it, are built upon a different system. Crudely put, much of European culture is organized, as anthropologist David Graeber noted, on constantly squabbling for advantage. Coarsely stated, a lot of European religion is devoted to individual, not communal, salvation. To study Mary Bravebird is to encounter a different view. And here I must offer a confession. An honest engagement with her spiritual activism is very hard. Over the course of the sermon series, we've been exploring the lives and thought of some people who combined mysticism with, spirit, with social activism. And in that definition of mysticism, we followed the lead of Howard Thurman, who told us that the mystic is someone who discovers within their own experience something that opens up to the infinite. The infinite in the particular, I've alternately phrased it, the challenge with counting, encountering the infinite in the particular or the general in the specific, if you prefer, in the life and writing of Mary Bravebird is that it demands a reckoning with a fundamental reality about the United States that generally gets ignored in all of our economic, political, and religious discourse. It's something that just doesn't get talked about all that much in public, especially in a state like Texas, where it's now almost against the law to teach actual history in the public schools. And that something can be summed up in a single word, genocide. Listen to what the historian Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz had to say about the matter, and this is a long quote, but it's important. U.S. history cannot be understood without dealing with the genocide that the United States committed against indigenous peoples. From the colonial period through the founding of the United States and continuing into the 21st century. This has entailed torture, terror, massacres, systematic military occupations, removals of indigenous peoples from their ancestral territories, and removals of indigenous peoples indigenous children to military-like boarding schools. U.S. history cannot be understood without dealing with the genocide that the United States committed against indigenous people. As in an engagement with Mary Brave Bird, Anna Mae Prequash, or Quash, Joy Harjo, or any other indigenous spiritual activist must include, for someone of European must dissent must begin with, an acknowledgement that the United States was founded upon genocide. It must also contain a recognition that in many ways the nation's genocidal practices continue. I am Mary Bravebird. After I had my baby during the siege of Wounded Knee, they gave me a special name, Octinqua Win, Brave Woman and fastened an eagle plume in my hair, singing Braveheart songs for me. I am a Sioux woman. That is not easy. I had my first baby during a firefight, with the bullets crashing through one wall and coming out through the other. Those are the words that Mary Bravebird chose to begin her 1990 memoir, Lakota Woman, We'll return to them, but first, U.S. history cannot be understood without dealing with the genocide that the United States committed against indigenous peoples. Yet portions of the historical profession and many political authorities who seek to regulate them and control the national narrative try to deny this reality. A couple of years ago, I had my own experience with how this works when an anonymous peer reviewer objected to one of my scholarly manuscripts. I had used the word genocide in too casual of a manner, they claimed, when I attempted to describe the federal government's policies under Andrew Jackson towards the nation's indigenous, or the continent's indigenous peoples. 
the reviewer seemed to think that my choice of wording was somehow irresponsible because, well, thousands of indigenous people perished during the Jackson administration, some of them survived. For my part, I was simply following the lead of indigenous study scholars like Dunbar Ortiz and activists like Mary Bravebird who are clear on the point. Dunbar Ortiz details through her work the ways in which the actions of the federal government over time have constituted genocide. She bases her claim on the 1948 United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It reads in part that the act of genocide is committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And she details in her scholarship how across the centuries the federal, state, and governments and their colonial predecessors have attempted to obliterate the indigenous nations of the continent. Brave Bird, for her part, recognized she had an urge to procreate as if driven by a feeling that I personally had to make up for the genocide suffered by our people. The reason she had six children, she records in her memoirs, included the reality that her older sister, Barbara, was sterilized against her will by a white doctor and unable to have any of her own children. The practice of forced sterilization, a certain act of genocide, was propagated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs until the 1970s. The babies that Brave Bird bore were part of her opposition to that genocidal practice. Our nation was born in genocide, observed Martin Luther King Jr. I am a Sioux woman. That is not easy, wrote Mary Brave Bird. Lifting up her spiritual activism, asking how she might serve as a guide to the questions, what is the good life? When you know you've been living it, what models should we follow as we seek to live into it requires an honest admissions like Martin King's. That is not easy. You are the one whose spirit is present in the dappled stars. Brave Bird was part of a generation who sought to rekindle traditional Sioux practices as an act of resistance to generations of genocide. In the 19th century, her people were, in, as she remembered, driven into reservations, fenced in, and forced to give up everything that had given meaning to their life. Their horses, their hunting, their arms, everything. But, she wrote, under the long snows of despair, the little spark of our ancient beliefs and pride kept glowing, just barely sometimes, waiting for a warm wind to blow the spark into a flame again. Brave Bird was someone who was responsible for kindling that spark back into a roaring fire. She's not a household name, so let me tell you a little bit about her. She was born in 1954 on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Given the name Mary Ellen Moore Richard at birth, her father was of mixed European and indigenous descent. Her mother was a full-blood brulee Sioux. Her father abandoned the family shortly after her birth. And so she grew up in a family that contained her, her mother, an abusive stepfather, and five siblings. A sixth had died as an infant, and her grandparents. They're the ones who took primary responsibility for raising her and connecting her with the Sioux traditions. They provided her with a loving environment and protected her from white cruelty. She was profoundly influenced by them until she was taken away to a boarding school around the age of 10. There, she was brutalized. The experience was so traumatic that she thought it was almost impossible to explain. 
She likened an attempt to describe what she underwent at the boarding school as as hard as the victims of Nazi concentration camps trying to tell average middle-class Americans what their experience had been like. The analogy is not hyperbole. It's one of the horrors of history that the Nazis based their anti-Semitic racial laws upon race laws and federal Indian law in particular in the United States. Kill the Indian to save the man was the sometime unofficial slogan of such places. I cannot call them schools, like the one where Brave Bird was forced to spend her adolescence. The boarding school did not succeed in killing the Sioux in her. She left and joined the American Indian movement while still a teenager. If you've not heard of it, it started in 1968 out of a coalition of indigenous people from many different communities. It brought together those living in the cities, often who had been forced, who had often people who had been forced from their land, with those living on reservations in an effort to revitalize indigenous culture and force the federal government to recognize indigenous rights. It was and is a religiously inspired organization opposed to genocide. Its members were targeted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, COINTELPRO, a government program designed to infiltrate and disrupt liberation movements, weighed heavily on it. Hundreds of its activists were probably murdered by at the behest of or with the complicity of FBI agents, though the actual death count is not possible to know. Many had their deaths ruled as a result of accidents or was, as initially the case of Anime Aquash, exposure. Her body was found frozen solid, though she died with a bullet lodged in her head. She was probably the victim of what's called bad jacketing, practice of the FBI to, that they use to destroy the American Indian movement by disowning distrust amongst the organization's leadership through falsely implying that particular individuals were informants. Anna May, a young, strong-hearted woman, was a powerful leader within AIM, and in the months preceding her death, many rumors circulated about her potential betrayal of the movement. I am a Sioux woman. That is not easy, wrote Brave Bird. She did not think of herself as a radical or a revolutionary. She and her people just wanted to be left alone, to live our lives as we see fit, to govern ourselves in reality and not just on paper. To govern ourselves, this meant a demand that the federal government abide by the 1868 tre Treaty of Fort Laramie and respect indigenous rights to the land and political and religious autonomy. The land was key. As Brave Bird put it, our land itself is a legend. The fight for our land is at the core of our existence as it has been for 200 years. Once the land is gone, we are gone too. She wrote those words in 1990. They could have been written yesterday. As anyone who paid attention to the 2016 events at Standing Rock knows, the struggle over indigenous land continues. Our land itself is a legend. You have to make your own legends now, she understood. And as part of AIM, she made some of those legends. In 1972, she took part in the Trail of Broken Treaties and along with other members of AIM, occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs headquarters in Washington, DC. In 1973, she was part of the occupation of Wounded Knee, an effort to rid the Pine Ridge Reservation of a corrupt tribal president who subscribed to the beliefs of the John Birch Society, favored tribal members with European blood over those who were full-blooded Sioux, and supported the genocidal policies of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. 
Wounded Knee was one of the pivotal moments of the 20th century's indigenous and U.S. history. It involved the occupation by aim of activists of a town that was the site of a notorious massacre in 1890. The deaths of more than 300 people there at the close of the 19th century is often thought to mark the end of indigenous autonomy in the United States. The 1973 occupation was meant to be, amongst other things, a symbolic rekindling of resistance. Brave Bird was there for most of it. She arrived at the town several months pregnant. She surrendered a few days after giving birth. While in Wounded Knee, she organized the community. She connected to traditional Sioux religious practices and dodged bullets from federal officials and supporters of the corrupt Pine Ridge president. She also deepened her relationship with the man who eventually became her husband, the traditional medicine man, Leonard Crow Dog. Leonard Crow Dog. This is a sermon about Mary Bravebird and not him. Even a brief description of his life would take us far beyond our time this morning. But it is worth noting that he is responsible for rekindling, for turning sparks into flames of numerous indigenous practices amongst Ames members. He spread the use of peyote as medicine for communing with all being. He incorporated the sweat lodge, the Sundance, and the vision quest into his political work. Though he never used a gun, he was jailed for two years. He had been sentenced to many more for supposedly being involved in violence. You are the one whose spirit is present in the dappled stars. The legacy of Leonard Crow Dog, the anime Pictou Aquash, Mary Brave Bird, and the American Indian Movement is hard to overstate. Their generation of activists managed to overturn the federal government's official policy of genocide. Indian boarding schools with their practices as difficult to speak of as Nazi concentration camps have largely been disbanded. Indigenous children are now able to be raised in their own communities. Traditional religious practices are no longer outlawed. Indigenous languages, once illegal to speak, are experiencing a resurgence and taught in schools. The noted legal scholar and member of the Eastern Shawnee tribe, Robert Miller, has argued that of all the periods of United States history, this is the best one for indigenous people. Anime, everything and nothing changes. That is not to say that life for most indigenous people on the continent remains anything other than difficult. Indigenous women are murdered at shocking rates. Life expectancies for indigenous peoples of all genders is just slightly more than 65 years, lower than that of people in Rwanda. Despite this, Ames' victories were nonetheless significant. I am a Sioux woman. That is not easy, Mary Brave Bird told us. She herself died of natural causes in her late 50s. But she survived until then, unlike her friend Anna May and so many other indigenous women of her generation. And that is why we have her story and not theirs. Her spiritual teaching I find almost impossible to distill into something digestible on a Sunday morning. To understand her, we would have to immerse ourselves in a cosmology and a land for which most of us is unfamiliar. I am unversed in the sun dance. I've never taken peyote. It's not for me to explain such practices to you. The fight for our land is at the core of our existence. And we live here in Houston on land taken from indigenous communities like the Karakawa, Karakana, the Wuchlikkan, and the Sana, not in the land of the Sioux. 
The meaning of the land that is to be found here is different than the meaning of the land found in Pine Ridge. But there are two things from Mary Brave Bird that can help us answer our own questions about the nature of the good life. First, we will only survive together. We are part of a community first and individuals second. That community must include the land on which we live. The earth is in me and I in it. And second, if we want to have an honest relationship with the land, with each other and with the country and with the spirit and all being, then we must face history. Not the pleasant history that denies genocide, not the easy history that the Texas legislature wishes upon us, but the real history that acknowledges it. And then with people like Mary Brave Bird, who survived, tries to move forward. You are the one whose spirit is present in the dappled stars. It is not easy. But still knowing it is not easy, I invite the congregation to say, Amen.